Hello there. Welcome to chapter 20 on the PP system. We're talking about how urine is formed, so we're not really talking about the penis, although the size of the penis in this case does matter because that will affect how much urine comes out every moment. Um, but we're not talking about the penis. That's for later. So uh, we'll take this possum penis and we'll take this walrus penis and we'll slide it right on out of here. Okay, uh, how's this stuff work? This is part one. Functions, so we're basically eliminating waste. That's the whole thing. And in that waste includes nitrogenous waste. These are uh, nitrogen-based compounds. Specifically, we'll talk about urea, uh, as well as toxins. You pee out all kinds of toxins and drugs. And by toxins, we also mean excess vitamins and garbage that you take into your system. Uh, and this is why you can also do a pee test for drugs, for cocaine or whatever, because it comes out in your system. Um, so, not only are we eliminating waste, but we're also maintaining water balance, osmotic balance, um, keeping electrolytes, so more or less depending on how much you've taken in, uh, maintaining acid-base balance in the blood. This is partially due to movement of hydrogen ions and also to CO2, although less, mostly hydrogen ions. Uh, altering blood pressure by absorbing or by reabsorbing or eliminating water, so altering blood volume. Red blood cell production through the uh, presence or the production of uh, urethropoietin from the kidneys, and then also activation of vitamin D. All right, let's look at the or organs. So we have the two kidneys on either side. Uh, they're called kidneys because they look like kidney beans. Uh, they're attached to ureters here on either side, and those ureters run to a urinary bladder down here at the bottom. And then the urinary bladder is attached to a urethra uh, in both males and females. The male urethra is much longer. Um, and that's how the urine uh, is excised. Now, uh, most of the structures that you see here, the ureters, bladder, and urethra, we'll focus on in part two. Today, we're just talking about the kidneys, which is the hardest or more complex part. They lie on your back wall, so you've all heard probably of a kidney punch, um, right at about between thoracic or T12 and uh, lumbar three, so right at kind of the middle of your back. Uh, the right kidney is slightly lower than the left, although that's not exactly important. Um, and then we already mentioned it's attached to ureters. There's also blood vessels called renal blood vessels. Renal means kidney. Um, and then on top of each of the two kidneys are the adrenal glands, which we've visited before. Now, the kidneys are covered in what's called a renal capsule. You'll see that when we dissect the cats. You'll see the, the kidneys are protected in that way. And then as well as a uh, adipose capsule, which is fat-based. The, the kidney is basically hiding in this package of fat. Um, and it helps to protect the kidney and, and keep it exactly where it needs to go so it doesn't float around and move around. It holds it in place. So each kidney specifically, or itself, if you do a cross-section, you would see inside, and there's two regions. There's the outer region called the cortex, and there's the inner region called the medulla. Um, and then all the urine that gets produced is collected in this region here, uh, in the calluses and this collecting tube that is the ureter here. Um, to take that blood, blood, to take the urine off to uh, the bladder. Now, medullary pyramids, if you look over here, that's the triangular region of tissues. This is a medullary pyramid. This is a medullary pyramid. They're part of the medulla, hence medullary pyramid. The renal columns are the actual cortex here that uh, plunges down into the medullary area. Here's a, a column, here's a column, and so on. Um, and then lastly, you have the calluses that are shown here, these structures. Uh, major and minor ma based on size, but they all help to funnel and feed the uh, urine from all the different nephrons that we'll talk about later in the medulla and the cortex uh, to collect the urine into the ureter. Now, you heard me talk about the word nephron. The nephron is the most complex and the most important part of the kidney. It's the functional unit of the kidney, the thing that actually processes and makes your urine. Um, and it has two main parts, a tube that's called the renal tubule, and the glomerulus, which is a ball of capillaries. So let's start talking with glomerulus first. It's a specialized capillary bed. We can see the glomerulus right here, okay? And it's attached to arteries on both sides. This is important because it helps to maintain a really high blood pressure all throughout. You'll also notice that the afferent arterial, afferent means towards, towards the glomerulus, is much bigger than the efferent. This is similar to what we saw in the lymph nodes, where there was more entries and fewer exits, and this helps to slow down the flow and also to increase the pressure. So we have a very high blood pressure in the uh, glomerulus here, which helps to push stuff into the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule that you see around it, wrapping around it like a horseshoe. 
um, because all the filtration occurs through blood pressure. Now, the capillaries themselves, we need a really high surface area, and this is important. Um, so, wrapping around um, is what are called podocytes. They're covered with podocytes from the renal tubule, and this kind of helps to make them consistent, so the blood of the glomerulus is consistent with the, the tubule itself. Um, that you can see, it's mentioned uh, 3A and 3B over here. These podocytes lining the surface. Okay, these little dotted, uh, hairy-like structures there, and that helps to increase um, area for doing filtration. Now, the glomerulus sits within the glomerular capsule, which is the end of the renal tubule. Uh, a lot of times people call this the Bowman's capsule. You'll hear me refer to it as both. Um, and again, the filtrate is going to go into the renal capsule. So here's the, the rest of the renal tubule that we see here. Here's the renal capsule, or Bowman's capsule, wrapped around the glomerulus. And then that renal capsule is going to become the proximal convoluted tubule. And it's convoluted, it goes all around. This is in the cortex region of the kidney. And then It's then going to go down uh, into often the medulla, although it doesn't have to. And the downward and upward part, this little skinny tube, we call the loop of Henle. And then as it rises back to the top, we have the distal convoluted tubule. Distal means on the other side in this case. Um, and then finally, the collecting duct to finish, where lots of different nephrons uh, connect up. You see the different connections here from many, many different nephrons. Um, so a large portion of nephrons are cortical nephrons, as we describe, which is all completely in the cortex, including the loop of Henle. So here you see, for example, a cortical nephron. Okay? Most of your nephrons are cortical. There's also medullary nephrons that you can see here, or juxta medullary nephrons. Juxta means to cross. Um, and these are at the border uh, of the cortex and the medulla, and the loop of Henle goes down into the medulla for these. Now, the uh, tubule itself is wrapped in capillaries. So there's a really important thing here that students often get confused by, okay? Here we have the main renal artery, A, and here's the afferent arteriole in B, and the efferent arteriole in D. So there is blood from the heart going to this one nephron, this glomerulus, and then it's still an artery that leaves the glomerulus, okay? And that artery that's leaving um, is going to branch out and form capillaries. And these capillaries are going to form what's called the vasa recta, and they wrap around the tubules, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal tubule. And that's so that things can be reabsorbed, and reabsorption means back into the blood. And they can also be excreted, which means to take it from the tubule, in, uh, and, or from the blood, and to put it into the tubule so it pees out. So again, Reabsorption is from the tubule into the blood. Excretion is from the blood into the tubule, so you can pee it out. So these wrap really closely to the tubule, so things can be exchanged back and forth. Um, and they have very low pressure inside these capillaries, and that aids the movement of things back into the blood, or if you like, reabsorption. So all these capillaries come from the efferent arteriole that came out of the glomerulus. And the, these are peritubular capillaries, or the vasa recta. Okay, now we get to the most complicated part of this uh, chapter on how urine is formed, okay? The, the overall process is filtration, marked by A, reabsorption, shown by B here, and then secretion, shown by C. All those three parts make up urine. And this is a, uh, an arrangement between the blood and the, uh, the nephron itself. We're, so we're focusing down into one nephron here. So filtration is non-selective and passive. Anything that is big enough that can be forced through the uh, walls of the glomerulus into the glomerular capsule is going to be pushed in. Sometimes if you've had a big protein meal, this can be protein. Sometimes, although it's not supposed to, it can be blood, it can be uh, chemicals that you've eaten, uh, and so on. Mostly it's small water-soluble proteins that get forced through. Um, but if you have large excess of certain things, they can also be pushed in or if you have some form of renal disease or beginning stages of renal disease, uh, you'll see some of these other items passing in. And we will later on do a, uh, a urinalysis test to see exactly how your kidneys are working, what's there, what's not, what's supposed to be, and so on. So the filtration creates what is called the filtrate, and that's the fluid that passes into the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule from the glomerulus. Then we have reabsorption. Okay, reabsorption is taking, again, stuff back into the blood. This is a lot of water, uh, sugar, any sugar that's passed in. You don't want to pee it out. You want to keep as much sugar as you can. 
Uh, amino acids that have passed in, you want to keep those to make proteins, so you would reabsorb those. And then some, some ions, depending on your electrolyte levels. Sodium, potassium, hydrogen ions, that kind of stuff. Some reabsorption is passive, but most of it is active. Active transport uses ATP. So it's so important that you keep those things that you are willing to uh, use up energy, ATP, to bring them back into their body. Most reabsorption, most importantly, occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, very early on. So it doesn't go through all the tubes and everything. Right, right away after it's entered um, the glomerular capsule, we then have the proximal convoluted tubule, and we get a lot of the reabsorption occurring back into the bloodstream. Some things you don't want to reabsorb, okay? These include the main waste, urea and uric acid. You don't do a lot of uric acid because it's very thick and viscous and toxic. This is actually bird poop, it's uric acid, um, and very, very acidic. Most of what you produce is urea, um, and we'll talk about urea later. And you're also going to not reabsorb any excess water. If you drink a lot of water, you're going to pee some out. Now, secretion, as we mentioned, is the opposite. It's going to move stuff from the blood back into the renal tubule. Um, so uh, this includes hydrogen ions and potassium ions. You're gonna, it's going to help to eliminate those. Uh, this is for acid-base balance. Um, and then creatinine we'll talk about. Don't worry too much, but that's um, also going to be secreted. And then anything excess that's left behind um, in the renal tubule is going to move on its way to the ureter um, to be peed out. Now, this chart, I'll describe it briefly, but what I want you to do is to open up the actual PowerPoint slides themselves and click on this picture. This is for an animation. Here's the website. If you like, instead, you can just write this down or, or type it in on a different window. And watch this. It's about five minutes. Watch it a few times. It's one of the best animations. It explains the entire formation of urine very succinctly and well, and that's the hardest, most complex part of this to learn, uh, and very important. So let's look at this generically. Here we have the glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and the proximal convoluted tubule. The uh, descending limb of the loop of Henle, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Now, again, the proximal convoluted tubule, you see most of the reabsorption occurring. This includes glucose and amino acids, and also hydrogen ions, uh, water. This is bicarbonate, salt, and so on. Now, the green is active transport, okay? Secreting stuff from the blood and from the fluid into the renal tubule, okay? The blue is passive transport. So if there's more water in the tubule than there is outside the tubule, water's gonna naturally flow out. And the same with bicarbonate. If you're uh, going to get rid of too much bicarbonate, it'll passively diffuse back into the interstitial fluid and into the blood. Um, whereas things like salt and glucose and amino acids, those are so important to keep that you actively transport those back into your body. You reabsorb those. Now, where it gets a little confusing is the descending and ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Here you see the thin part, you notice it's actually thinner, of the loop of Henle. This is where only water gets reabsorbed and it's passively transported. This water leaves or changes because as we go down deeper into the kidney, you get more and more concentrated. So the fluid out here outside the nephron gets more and more concentrated as we go vertically down. And thus, that has a stronger and stronger pull on water because water is going to move towards where the salt is, towards where there's more concentrated stuff. And that salt came from the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So descending was just water moving and passively. Ascending thin limb, we have passive transport of salt. It's going to be very highly concentrated in the tube, in the renal tubule here. So it moves from high concentration out to lower concentration to build up this NaCl outside. And that's going to attract this water from the descending limb, as we mentioned. Then you have the thick ascending limb. It gets less concentrated out in the interstitial fluid here. So there's less of a passive force to move the salt out of the uh, ascending limb. So in this case, when it gets thicker, uh, we now use active transport to move additional salt out. And all of this is meant to just try to um, concentrate the urine, to keep the good stuff, remove the bad stuff, and concentrate the urine. Then we get to the distal convoluted tubule, where you do some final reabsorption and secretion, um, and then the collecting duct. And again, once you go down the collecting duct, the further down you go, the more concentrated the urine is going to get, and the more concentrated the interstitial fluid is also going to be. Here you're actively transporting salt out as needed. It doesn't have to happen, but you're going to actively transport it out in order to save some if need be, um, because usually you're going to keep more of the salt inside the renal tubule. And then you're also going to passively lose water, 
uh, a little bit of urea depending on the concentrations. And then we also mentioned, we already mentioned water there. So that's the most complicated part. Watch the animation. Um, when we do the p-test later, you're going to see some specific things for medical diagnosis that uh, include the color of your urine. So uh, they say your urine is supposed to be basically clear. If your urine is at all yellow, you're not drinking enough water. The yellow color comes from urochrome, the pigment urochrome, which is the breakdown of hemoglobin in the spleen and the liver. Um, it's not actually from urea. People think yellow is from the urea. It's not. It's from the urochrome pigment, which is the breakdown of hemoglobin. Uh, pee is sterile. You could drink it if you wanted, uh, although it's just slightly aromatic, sometimes not so slightly. Uh, it does smell. Uh, normal pH is around 6. You could pee on a stick uh, and take your pH. We will do so later on, but uh, pH is less important. And then the specific gravity we'll talk about later, how that's a reflection of the concentration of your urine or what you're peeing out, how much stuff is in there, how heavy is it, if you like. Uh, and then the last thing uh, attached to the kidneys, you know, is the ureter. They take the urine that's formed off to the bladder, uh, and it's continuous with the renal pelvis, which you saw at the, at the, here's the kidney, here's the renal pelvis here, and then the ureter runs down. Um, and then a, there's a little bit of peristaltic action on the membrane around the, uh, or the, the smooth muscle that makes up part of the uh, ureters. There's peristaltic action, which squeezes um, down, down, uh, to help the urine move into the bladder. And on that note, I am finito.